What's going on, my people, my people? How are y'all doing today? Welcome to another episode of Through a Culture Lens. My name is Michael Anthony, and with me, as always, is a woman. If you pat her on the back, you need to put on your resume. Amber Gray, how you doing today, girl? Excellent, excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You know, it's been a while since we've uh, gotten up. You know, we've definitely been in communication, but when during that time, it was cold. And it was COVID. So I'm glad mm-hmm. that we was able to finally get back together. The weather's starting to break and everything is yep. starting to, you know, work its way out, you know. That's so, right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yep. I know. You've had we've had a busy couple of months and, and COVID and the cold just don't don't go uh, hand in hand. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't. So that's what I'm going to blame it on, uh, on why we haven't done, you know, anything in a while. I'm just going to blame COVID. Rona. Rona did it. You know? Yeah. Um, We're yeah. doing some restructuring, talking about where we want the show to go. So hopefully you guys give us some of your ideas. Um, you know, we just want to make sure the show is entertaining, informative, uh, truthful, um, all of that. So we're trying to figure it out. We're figuring things out, but please stay, you know, stay on the journey. Um, hopefully, um, we got something with, you know, what you like, let us know in the comment section, if you have some ideas and also what you think about this show, I mean, it's been a while, so. It's been a while. Absolutely. And we're definitely trying to keep more abreast on uh, coming up with content a little bit more and, uh, please hit that thumbs up. Please share, please like all that good stuff. Uh, you know, supposed to subscribe. Say that. All um, that. Exactly. You know, we're on Spotify now. Um, we're all over the yes. place. We're on Apple Music. Yes, check right us out now. on Spotify. Yeah, yeah. check yeah. us out. We have a pod. Yeah, we've got podcast slash video podcast on Spotify. So please check us out on all those platforms wherever you get your podcasts. Wherever you get your yeah, Apple Apple Music, uh, Anchor, Spotify. You know, we we just everywhere. Stitcher, um, yep. FM Radio. We we everywhere now. So you know, uh, please check us out. But without further ado, we want to go ahead and get into the topic. Now, we were debating on if we were going to do a Black History Month, you know, show. Because it was Black History Month, we're black. Our content is mainly geared towards black content, uh, black ideas, black themes, um, because we're through a cultured lens. Uh, But then we decided not necessarily to do a Black History Month episode because black history is American history. And... Like, we need to sort of have this conversation of putting black history into this one thing, into this one idea. And because black history is American history, we were like, no, we're going to do it, a, you know, a couple of days after Black History Month because we ha- we can, because we can, because we black. Exactly. I mean, black history is 365. It shouldn't be 28 days. It shouldn't be a week like how mm-hmm. it started. And mm-hmm. I get why it was a week when it started, because mm-hmm. that's probably all... Uh, they could muster to give us. They didn't want to give us anything. But a week was like, y'all can have a week. Fine. Exactly. Exactly. We'll have the rest of 51 weeks. You have that one week. Fine. Whatever. So um, I think it was necessary, you know, in the past, but it'd be nice if it could be more integrated into the history curriculums um, in every school Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and not just separate it out as something, you know, separate, something that doesn't quite gel with the uh, pristine history that America likes to teach its students. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, and let's get right to a little bit of teaching because I'm pretty sure people out there don't even know how Black History Month even was created. Somebody probably thought a white man waved a wand and then boom, Black History Month and like they gave us right. something. But it wasn't yeah. necessarily like that. A man named Carter G. Woodson, um, he was a professor, a scholar, a writer. He, it was his birth child back in 1917. He uh, took a visit to D.C. and saw that there was a prosperous, emerging black community of intellectuals and entrepreneurs and artists in Chocolate City, where you are residing right now. And he got so inspired by seeing black people in these positions that he created this organization called the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History. And with this organization, they started these national celebrations. And the first was called the Negro History Week, which um, the reason why um, it's in February is because it actually uh, celebrates in between Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln's birthdays, which is the second week of February. So back in 1917, whenever they created this Negro History Week in D.C., it was because of so that's the reason why it's in February is because of Frederick Douglass and um, Abraham Lincoln. But then he also did some other things with um, the uh, association. He also created this the Journal of Negro History, which were published every year, to, you know, trying to highlight different segments. Of course, back then they didn't have Google. 
So my man had to go out and do field work, almost documentary style work, to go out and get these narratives about black life around the country. Um, he also taught classes. You know, this is a class right here that he taught in D.C. and Northwest, which was the Negro in American history, the history of the American or I'm sorry, or the history of the American nation as influenced by contact with Negroes. He was teaching this class in 1917. So my man yeah. was, you know, a trailblazer. Head, trailblazer, just the head of it. He wasn't somebody who was talking about, oh, we need to do this for the people. No, he was actually out there putting his name out there and really trying to institute this idea of celebrating, you know, black people and what we have come from and what it is that we're contributing to society. And he really wanted to encompass it into one week, but I think he just wanted to start the highlight of it for one week. But then I think he learned something along his way, right? There was there something yeah. that kind of took him off a little bit? I think he knew along the way, uh, even before he started this journey, I think that's why this journey started with the association mm -hmm. and why it started, started with the journal. He mm -hmm. knew mm -hmm. prior to that, but, um, one thing about Carter G. Woodson, um, this man loved education, even mm -hmm. though he was not really educated in his early life because mm -hmm. of the enslavement of his family mm -hmm. um, and his um, inability to go to school because it was not something that was um, uh, available to him. But mm -hmm. besides all of those type of, you know, early starts and being, you know, um, not given the same education as his, the white peers in his, in his neighborhood in, in Virginia, he still was at his zest for learning wanted to you know better himself so he went to university of chicago got a bachelor's degree went to harvard university and got a phd was the second black man black person to get a phd the first being wb dubois um and then with all of that he decided to teach so he taught in kentucky he taught um obviously in washington dc and through all those transitions and those life experiences he was realizing and i believe he probably realized this like i said before the start of his organizations in this journal that the educational system was not great mm -hmm. the american educational system was not great it was not great specifically for the black learner but it wasn't great in general because it was completely biased it had a eurocentric spin um and it elevated one group over another mm -hmm. and i think we already know what what groups those were so when you have such a bias in the educational system and you're omitting a lot of the contributions from one whole group, mm -hmm. um, you're going to get a, a type of learning that's going to be a little bit fractured on top of um, self-esteem. It's hard to grow your self-esteem if you think that you have done nothing. If you've come from nothing, the people that look like you are nothing, um, they contributed nothing to society. Um, he realized what a powerfully... Um, you know, indoctrination that was, you know, to really put in to the books and to the teaching of how great Europeans were, European descendants were, look at where we started, look at, um, you know, Roman, the, the uh, you know, Rome, look at, you know, the different um, countries were, which were primarily white, look at all they've contributed to society, which have created this American way of life, which have created this American educational system, but you, black person you came from nothing you came from squalor there's nothing that anybody that looks like you has ever contributed mm -hmm. to society that messes with your psyche that's going to mess with anybody's psyche if they think that they come from nothing and will eventually be nothing because nobody has made it out of that cycle of um of servitude of weakness no one's made it out so it was a form of control to make sure that that kind of information was um withheld um but it, you know, it was bad on both sides. You've got one group of students being taught how wonderful they are, how great the contributions of their forefathers were. Um, it's an inflated self-esteem. It's an inflated ego. Um, it's a white supremacist leaning, um, you know, teaching model, which of course, on the other side of the pendulum, has students um, either wanting to be white who are not, or hating themselves um, and and giving up on any sort of future that they might have. So. It was, I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible indoctrination. And this is what he's talked about with the indoctrination of the black man. How, you know, how have black people learned, you know, what have they learned about themselves through the school system? You know, what, where, where can they go to have a healthy mindset, have a healthy community, have a healthy life. If the very basic necessities of just learning, learning the basic math, the history, the English has been completely 
warped into something that, um, you know, is not advantageous for black students, um, not helpful for, for black students, um, that a deficit just for being black, depending on the schools that they go to. It, you know, it was, it's a discussion that, you know, we I think we've had time and time again, just about the chicken and the egg. It's like, how did our communities get like this? You know, how do we, how do we get out of this system? And a lot of it, you know, is education, right? So one of the quotes that he's, um, that I have kind of gravitated to in this particular book, The Miseducation of the Negro is when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his action. When you, you do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for him for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. That mm-hmm. line, his education makes it necessary, mm-hmm. is the indoctrination we're talking about. It was imperative that black students knew how less they were compared to white students. That was part of the indoctrination. That was part of the education. Um, there was no intention to ever teach black kids. There was no intention. So just with, you know, our ancestors fighting, um, making sure that their kids got taught and then their kids and their grandkids got taught um, and were able to go to school. Um, the fight that we know that's happened, you know, the Ruby Bridges. I mean, that was, she's only 67 years old. So we're talking about within our own life, our family's lifetime, having to fight to go to school, mm-hmm. having to fight to go to a school that has proper funding, right? Mm-hmm. So. These are things that are not new. These are things that are within the last 60, 70, 80 years. People who are 80, you know, still mm-hmm. living, having to fight just to have the proper education. So that's one that's one discussion. So just to have the proper education. And the proper education is what? The proper education is an equitable education. Mm-hmm. It's an education where it is not lifting one group over another. Mm-hmm. It's not biased and slanted. It's the truth. It's the truth on how things are. It's giving every student equal opportunity to learn in a school setting. Um, what makes that difficult is funding. So that's something that we'll talk about right now. So in, just in 19, we're talking about 1930s here, there was the average school expenditure per student was $45 per white student and $14.95 per black student. Mm. Now the Southern investment was far different. I think we could have imagined that the deficit was gonna be pretty large for black students. Mm-hmm. $120.09 per white student for the average Southern investment for education and $29.62 for black students. That gap, hmm. <laughs> that gap, and the yeah. gap is huge. So when we're thinking about why, you know, we hear time and time again, like I brought up, why are blacks not progressing? Why are black, why is it, um, you know, the uh, graduation rate so low for black schools? Why are they not going to higher education, you know, at the same rate as white, their white peers? Well, this is it. If you're going to a school that has no air, no water, and we're talking about in 2021, I mean, we, there's, which will be in the show notes, there, there are schools in Baltimore that currently have no running water in their functioning schools. Mm -hmm. No HVAC systems. Mm -hmm windows that are completely soldered shut because they can't afford to redo them they can't afford to replace the windows so instead of replacing them they're just gonna completely shut them completely so no one can know which is a a fire hazard you can't you shouldn't be able to permanently shut windows but this is the kind of learning environments that black students are faced with or minority students are faced with as opposed to a well-funded school in a white neighborhood so the outcomes are going to obviously be a complete difference if you're able to have you know math classes up to trigonometry but i'm at my black school i could barely get to algebra i could because there's no money to fund a teacher who can teach trigonometry Mm -hmm. so i'm stuck at at the algebra level you know or the geometry level whatever level that might be um so how am i going to compete in the world if i don't even have the kind of access that my counterparts have across across the pond Mm -hmm. across the street wherever that might be Mm -hmm. So that's one that's one area where, yes, the educational system and the material is a failure because of the bias, but not only that, it's the funding. We are drastically underfunded. And we'll go to 2021. 2021, black majority schools received $23 billion less mm-hmm. than majority white schools with the same number of students. So from 1930 to 2021, 
nothing has changed. Mm. Drastically underfunded teachers who are just out of college typically go to black schools. They last a year or two. So the turnover rate is awful. They're not being paid. Um, the students have no kind of, you know, uh, you know, normalcy, you know, any sort of stability. Um, so again, it's hard to learn in those kind of environments, but that's never the discussion that we really get to because we're always in this catch-up game. You know, we're always trying to get, figure out how we can make these schools better funded. Well, if we're going to be in the same model of your tax money from your housing going into the school system, we're going to always be in a losing game. There needs to be a new model, which a lot of people are talking about now, bringing more grants and more funding in through a non-tax model because the non-tax model is going to always put you know, the prominent people with large homes, you know, large tax brackets at a at an advantage and students with, you know, the opposite end and a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this economic thing is so deep because it goes into housing because the way mm -hmm. that they judge like good housing market is based off of the schools. It, that's what right. a realtor told me. So if you want a house that will eventually grow more and you'll be able to get more equity into your home, that look at the school district and that will tell you how much the value is, but then who determines the value and well, yeah, yeah. I but, mean, it's inner, it's, it's, it's cyclical mm -hmm. because the school systems will not, will not grow and become a prominent school. If the tax money doesn't grow in that particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and of course we've, you know, we've talked about redlining before the redlining epidemic was something that primarily, um, was something the black you know families had to deal with where we were kind of relegated to these quote unquote ghetto areas mm -hmm. where we you know were not receiving the tax funding because our houses were worth grow you know completely less than the white uh, family home across the street that might be the exact size mm -hmm. have the same land mass have all the same attributes as the white family's house but for the simple fact that it's a black neighborhood the value was low mm -hmm. so that if the value is low the tax money is going to be low the value is high, the tax money is going to be high. That's the system we're working with here. So no matter how you slice it, if your house is in an area that is deemed black, unfortunately, <laughs> that's deemed black or undesirable, your tax money is not going to be high. Therefore, your school system is not going to be desirable. And that's mm -hmm. just how it is in this model. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the thing that we even know about going on today. So, you know, we look at this Carter G. Woodson, this is from 1930, but we've heard reports of people recently, as recent of last year, where they would have to get a white stand-in to get their home appraised. So you're getting your home appraised as a black person, your house is valued less than a white person who's in there, but that's based off of, you know, somebody's observation of you. They don't know you, right. you know, they can see everything that's mapped out, you know, your house value, but then just based off your skin color would determine the value of your house within which then goes into the school system so mm -hmm. you know they're creating these systems on barriers. purpose yeah these barriers yeah. on purpose just so then uh we don't so then we are not able to you know understand and better learn it so in this situation they're diminishing or sanitizing the quantity of the information in history uh in order to streamline it for their own ideology but then also they're not even giving us the quality of education in order for us to even compete because the economics is not there. And that is sad. Mm -hmm. And, exactly. and then, you know, and then it brings in the question like, well, you know, what's, you know, like with black history and, you know, us knowing that we're not getting the truth being told. And this started in 1917 again. And then in 1933, that's when Carter G. Woodson wrote the miseducation of a Negro. And then Amber just told you guys the differences of really 90 years, something, something like that, 90 years of difference. You know, I'm sorry, it was $91. It was $91 difference in 1930 that they were given students. But 1917 to 1922, I mean, uh, uh, 2022, what would that be? 105 years, I think, something like that, if that's quick math. Something like that. Yeah, like, a, like yeah, so 105 years ago, whenever Black History Week or month, you know, Negro History Week was started, it was to try to bring in, you know, the truth about black people's contributions and trying to give us our own identity. And then, of course, we fast forward to what we see here, 2021, and the economics aren't there. But then also we have this wider conversation because we have to bring this in. And is that critical race theory is white history. And, 
you know, y'all try y'all's best to, you know, not include it in the overall conversation, but we have school districts being threatened and people protesting to stop with uh, critical race theory, which critical race theory is actually a law practice, a theory, a, um, you know, as you can see up here, we have, you know, MIT, Columbia, Duke University, they're all teaching some form of critical race theory, which are three of the top 10 schools in the country. And yet you have parents saying, no, we don't want to have you teach this course because it will make my child feel bad. Um, the thing is, though, how can you escape the fact that uh, critical race theory isn't part of white history? When we're talking to you about the facts and Carter G. Woodson was trying to institute black history more as an American history model, but then you're trying to, again, desanitize it with the quantity of information and the quality of the education by even doing this. And just think, you want your children to go to these schools, you know, so why is it that you wouldn't prepare them to give them the ammunition, you know, before they go there and actually to be more, epi you know, um, you know, uh, Empathetic. 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 Yeah. There you go. More empathetic yeah. and more open minded and even diversify their mind as far as ideas and cultures and different things like that. You just want to close that in because you don't want them to feel bad because they're eight or they're, you know, 15 or something like that. And you know what? Nobody wants your child to feel bad, but they should know what the truth is and what the history is. So that means we can eventually get to a better society um, than what we've been living in and what we've been used to because me and you being black, we've learned about race at a very early age. Um, and now you're trying to take away this conversation away from white kids when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and I'm going to you know, pass it to you. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said, and I said this on a previous episode too, where he said that white people believe in ghosts and they believe in racism. Even though that there is empirical facts all yeah. over that there was systematic um structures and barriers put in place for people of color to not be able to advance or even get anywhere close to any type of economic wealth gap. And it starts with the educational system. That would have to be, everything you're saying is good. Mm -hmm. Everything you're saying is logical. Everything mm -hmm. you're saying most, again, you know, the word empathetic, mm -hmm. logical people mm -hmm. would want for a society but when you're dealing with a group of people and not all people within the group, when yep. you're dealing with a group mm -hmm. of people who have existed in a hierarchical structure mm -hmm. where they are at the top, any sort of change from that hierarch hierarchical structure is going to ruin the very fabric of the lives that they have fabricated mm -hmm. or created for themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, like I remember when I was in, in, in high school, there were certain cultures that didn't want their kids to go to school because they actually didn't want them to learn too much. Mm -hmm. They didn't want them to have that kind of indoctrination, like, you know, exactly. You know, and you hear that a lot with, um, you know, with some people on the, on the right who talk about the indoctrination of the, of uh, the liberal mm -hmm. school system mm -hmm. of the liberal, you know, collegiate system, because they don't want the full picture mm -hmm. being kind of put out there. Mm -hmm. That full picture is going to open up Pandora's box mm -hmm. and they're not ready for that. And that's mm -hmm. why um, if you do a whole like search, you do a Google search on CRT, you're going to get some false, false articles. Mm -hmm. You're going to get um, false statements being made by people on the right just to scare their base. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the idea of them actually learning how things have functioned in the society, how things function differently for people within the society. Um, all of those things, that's going to be a complete um, shift to how they operate in the world. That's going to be a power dynamic they're not ready for. That's going to be um, just mass hysteria mm -hmm. for, for that mm -hmm. particular group of people. Because they, we were not just like um, Carter G. Woodson. His education makes it necessary. Our education mm -hmm. to be of servitude, mm -hmm. to be lesser, to be weaker, is the necessary evil that they need in order to operate in a society which they are on top. Hmm. Hmm. So all of this that they're doing, this protesting, and all of what Carter G. Woodson and said in the in the tens and twenties and thirties, there these are those were their great grandparents, mm -hmm. those were their great their grandmothers, those were them. Some of them that are still alive, you know, that are mm -hmm. ninety. 
there's no difference. White supremacy is is upholded and will always be upholded by a group who's afraid to let go of power. And so we're never going to get this empathetic kind of kumbaya from them. And we have to kind of like accept that. And I've, I've kind of been like, you know, I'll, it is what it is. <laughs> yes, I agree. I agree with me living in Virginia. You know, we were definitely, uh, especially right up the road in Latin County, that was on the national news because that sort of helped powder keg event in a way. Um, this whole right. CRT and parents having the choice and things like that. And then it just started filter. And yeah, I didn't go to one council meeting. I didn't stand up and, you know, give my reason. I, I probably should have. But then I just took the responsibility because I know that the system, even if I go there, they're not going to change anything. So then it's my responsibility as a parent to just teach my children at home, um, you know, kind of have them do further research on what's being taught to them in school and then also fill in the blanks of what they're leaving out. Right. You know, so yeah. I, mm -hmm. That's what you have to do. I mean, as a as a as a conscious parent, even if you're not of color, but as a conscious parent, and specifically if you are of color, you have to teach your kids at home because they are not going to get any sort of, you know, realistic, truthful, like all encompassing education when it comes to you know our school systems. That's something that I've known. You know, even before I had kids, it is what it is. You're not going to get the real deal. Right. Mainly because, again, it's just it's this it's a status quo thing. Right. It's I don't want to hurt feelings, even mm -hmm. though like you and I've talked about we've our feelings have been hurt every day, especially when we were kids. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had certain situations that we probably should not have had at seven, eight and nine years old because we were not white mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're using that as an excuse mm -hmm. is like so just but silly. Just, it's, silly it's but that's what it is exactly um, exactly you know and yeah i think it's um it's, it's just going to be continued fight the thing is though we can you know do the numbers and see that we have been fighting for this continuously and really the only reason why negro history week even became black history month is because of what happened in the civil rights whenever students were you know protesting and doing sit-ins in uh, administrative buildings in order to get black studies in those PWIs and even some HBCUs around the country to where then they finally started putting it in colleges and then Gerald Ford in 1976 said, okay, I'll go ahead and recognize it and give you a month. Um, exactly. But, you know, we're just, you know, caught in, you know, this thing, but I would say just, you know, sit down with your kids, talk to your kids, talk to your nephews, talk to your nieces, talk to your cousins, if anybody's of the younger generation. And we've had this conversation on the show before, you know, again, this is through a culture lens. I'm Michael Anthony. This is Amber Gray. Thank you for joining us. Please hit that thumbs up, subscribe, notification, all that good stuff. Um, That's right. Is, um, is, you know, where we, even as black people, don't want to necessarily look at the past because of the trauma and the hurt that we've gone through, you know, to watch a 12 years a slave. You know, it's very emotional for us watching anything like Roots, watching Rosewood, watching those type of movies really sort of gives us a, a different sort of visceral effect. But the thing is, though, we need to watch these movies with our kids. We need to watch them with, you know, and hopefully they're making more content that sort of, you know, kind of plugs in these missing pages of history that they keep on trying to rip out. Um, right. So you're just going to have to just buck up and be like, yeah, I understand you don't want to see it. But if there's a young person out there and you are talking about them and saying these young kids ain't out, out here ain't doing nothing, ain't when have you gone up to them and asked them about Cardi G Woodson, about Black History of Month, about black right. tropes, about these things? Then, you know, if you haven't, then come and join in the fight, you know, and That's one, right. you know, and one, you know, suggestion I would give is start with this movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's light. It's not too heavy. You know, you probably even enjoy it. And it's the movie's called More Than a Month. Um, uh, the filmmaker, I cannot pronounce his name. You did it better, uh, better than I have before. But I think it's Shukri, his name. Hassan Tillman. I don't know. Shukri, Shukri. So, brother, we do apologies. I could do Hassan. I could do Hassan. Okay. I apologize. Right, right, right. Yeah, we just, we, we, you know, that's our indoctrination that we can't even pronounce your, your African name I know. correctly. <laughs> you know, so we'll admit to it. But um, definitely, we put a link in the show notes. This uh, movie is free and available for you to watch. Um, it's actually 10 years old. It was made in 2012. And it was a filmmaker's journey on ending Black History Month in instituting black history as American history. And it's about an hour long. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I definitely, if I had to rank it or give it some ratings out of five stars, I'd probably give it four. You know, there's just a couple of things here and there, you know, but 
overall, I thoroughly enjoyed the journey, especially me being a documentarian and a black person um, and having these same questions. Um, it definitely made me feel like, okay, well, I ain't got to do that now. And it actually did give me some sort of um, conclusion at the end. Like, I didn't feel like I had to keep waiting on something else. It, it, it gave a good beginning, middle, and end story-wise and narrative-wise. But how did you yeah, feel about I thought, it? Yeah, I thought it was good. I gave, I'll probably give it about the same. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a novel idea, a novel concept. I think, um, you know, Morgan Freeman talked about it years ago mm -hmm. about, I don't, you know, really celebrate Black history because Black history is American history. Mm -hmm. Why is it separated out? Mm -hmm. And I, I tend to agree. Um, but again, it's like, we just talked about the CRT thing and the pushback that's getting. Mm -hmm. And no matter how hard we try to tell the truth in this country, nobody seems to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. It's either, and you make a good point. It's either, you know, black folks that don't want to hear or see nothing about slavery. And I, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like trauma porn as people call it. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got the other group who just wants to sanitize everything. Mm -hmm wants to make sure that what it is, whatever it is, make sure they don't look too bad. Don't mm -hmm. make us look too bad, please. Um, so we really aren't able to tell the full truth because we've got one group who's in denial and the other group who's worn out mm -hmm. because it's just, it's tiring to, to see black bodies brutalized um, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So yes, would I like to see history, uh, black history, you know, and, you know, ingrained into the American history curriculum? Sure. I don't think we have enough strong um equality minded people to make that happen based off of the suppression that's happening now with black authors black literature happening in schools now mm -hmm. because of the crt discussion because of the bias um you know within changing any sort of curriculum that shows any sort of you know you know american history the the good bad and the ugly mm -hmm. so i doubt that would be a helpful transition out of a black history model into american history model it's hopefully one we can do at some point, but I don't think we have enough strong people yeah, to, yeah. to make that happen. I agree. I agree. Well, I think we can go ahead and I think we, we covered quite a bit. I think we covered quite I a did. bit. So, um, you know, of course, if you guys have stayed into the end, you know, typically we like to do these marathon runs, but we're just going to try and cut a little quick, let you get your day, you know, back started. supposed to be nice this weekend, depending on where you're at. If you're on the East Coast, we're supposed to have some nice weather. Um, but is there anything closing that you would like to kind of leave us with before we, um, dip out and, uh, come back Just, to the people? Just, uh, make sure, yeah, make sure, you know, one thing I've tried to make a goal is, is, um, is getting myself more acquainted with, with history and American history, because when you are a kid and learning such, um, grandiose things that people that don't look like you do, you tend to get a little disillusioned. That's kind of part of my indoctrination where I just turned away. I'm like, I don't need to hear what Columbus did every single October 9th, because I highly doubt that this man was helpful. So I'm glad we've gotten rid of that day. Yes. But <laughs> right. as a kid, that was a day that was something to celebrate, right? Like we had to celebrate that. We, we got talked a day about off that from ad school. nauseum. We got a day off from school. So, you know, I remember feeling like um, there's absolutely nothing that I get throughout the school year that has anything to do with black contributions, anything to do with black history, or just history of people of color in general. It was barely any of that information. So I kind of shied away from some of that, but I wanna you know, make sure I get some truthful, unbiased history. And I hope you all do the same. In addition to making sure that you're checking out people that are not the four black history marvels that we see every February, the you know Rosa Parks, the MLKs, the Frederick Douglass and the Harriet Tubman's expand that because there's so many people who have contributed to not only this society but african society mm -hmm. european society um who look like us that we need to go ahead and make sure that we're we're researching because it's it does do something for you when you find an ancestor who was able to take so with you know with so little was able to do so much mm -hmm. and that does help kind of give you that kind of confidence and give you that kind of drive for whatever you're doing in your life to know that they had it in a, you know, bad, but they were able to make this out of that. Mm -hmm. It does do, it does do wonders and that, and make sure your kids, you're teaching your kids. Cause again, the kids are not going to get what they need from school. We have to give that to them. No matter how hard we try to fight the school systems, the school boards, they're not going to get the full picture and we need to provide that for them. Exactly. So I just, char I challenge everybody to do all those things. Exactly. Exactly. Just do research. And kind of admit that you know we've been indoctrinated everything that we've been taught is not real mm -hmm. and uh, do your own research create your own narrative because uh, we've been other for too long um, that's right but you know folks thank you again if you've been staying to the end you're a real one appreciate your support 
Um, we're definitely going to be coming out with some new episodes um, and some other, you know, fun things that's coming up. Um, and on that note, um, I will just say love, peace, and power. I'll let you folks. See you soon. Bye.